All right, it's a go. Cool. All righty. Hello, and welcome to the Texas Archaeological Society's special publication session. This morning, we are honored to have two authors of recent TAS special publications, special publication number six and special publication number seven, join us to talk a little bit about the projects covered in these works. First up is Dr. Tamara Walter, Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Texas Tech University. Dr. Walter received her PhD from the University of Texas in 2000 and specializes in historic archeology, span mission studies, colonialism and conflict, negotiating identities in colonial settings, coastal Ecuador, prehistoric populations and interaction with local ecosystems. She has led an archeological field school for Texas Tech students for several years across mission sites in Texas, including Presidio San Sabah, which also hosted several TAS field school sessions between 2003 and 2007. The archeological investigations at Presidio San Sabah are the focus of the TAS special publication number six. Dr. Walter, hello, the floor is Hi. yours. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna hope this all works. So I will share my screen. All right, are you seeing that? Yep, you're good. Right. Good, okay. Hi, I'm Tamara Walter. I'm the author of the special publication number six, which details the results of, of our investigations at Presidio San Saba. So in this image that you see on the right, this is a bird's eye view of, um, I'm gonna move you guys out of the way so everybody can see it. Um, it's a, it's a bird's eye view of what the site looked like when we arrived here in 2000. Actually, what you're looking at is the results of the 1930s w, WPA style project to reconstruct the northwest corner of the fort. Um, the uh, reconstruction was actually just only in that section of the site and it's actually a much much bigger site and uh, if you don't know this it's, if you don't know this already it's actually the largest spanish fort in texas okay so texas tech began field schools at the site in the year 2000 and this was initiated by my predecessor dr grant hall i took over from there and we conducted uh field schools there for about 10 years um from 2000 to 2010, 2011. And during three of those years, the uh, TAS joined us in 2003, 2004, and 2007. 2007 was an important year because that marked the 250th anniversary of the founding of that site. So I'm gonna do, cause I don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna do a very brief overview of the history of the site. San Saba was established in 1757 along the San Saba River in what is today Menard County, Texas. At the time of its founding, 100 soldiers were stationed there along with their wives and families. So you had about 230, 250 people that were living there. In the beginning, the garrison was commanded by Colonel Perea and later it was uh, under the authority of Captain Felipe Rabago y Taran. There was also a mission in association with the Presidio, Mission San Saba. It was also located along the San Saba River, but it was situated four miles away from the Presidio, which proved disastrous. Um, the mission was short-lived. It was only there for about 13 months when it was attacked by the Comanche and their Norteño allies. The Comanche were particularly upset that the Spanish had formed an alliance with the Lapan Apache by making a mission for them, for the Lapan. And so this was a result of that. Um, they, when they arrived the day of the attack, they entered the, the mission and they began to ransack it. They burned down all the buildings and they killed a handful of people, including two priests who are depicted here in this painting. They are uh, martyrs and uh, this this painting also depicts the attack. Now, after the destruction of the mission, it did not reopen, but the Presidio did remain open. And um, 
At the time of the attack, the commander in control of the garrison was Perea. And after the, the mission was destroyed, he carried out a punitive expedition. He chased the mission offenders all the way up to the Red River where a battle ensued. And there are debates about the outcome of that battle, but at the time, the Spanish officials viewed it as a failure on Perea's part. And so as a result, they replaced Perea with Captain Rabago as commander of the fort. Rabago, when he arrives, sees that the fort is in shambles and he begins to reinforce it, uh, building a log stockade. And eventually he constructs a stone fortress like you see up here in the top photo on the left. The Presidio remains in operation until 1770 when it's closed down and Rabago is in charge mostly that the, the entire uh, time until it is closed. So in terms of the goals of our excavation, when we arrived, we didn't know much about the architecture of the site. So we were really wanting to identify and describe original architecture. We wanted to know if there were any really original foundations. The town of Menard had torn down many in, when it was when it was first established, the town in the 1880s, I think, they encouraged the, the, the town members to go, you know, oh, you need building stone, just go over to the old uh, mission slash fort. They didn't even know it was a fort and uh, take some of that stone and you can use it to build your house. As a result, there's not left above the surface. I mean, what you're seeing up here in the upper photo is just what was done during the 1930s and um, not original architecture. So we wanted to see if we could find any we also wanted to, to see if we could define a building sequence. One of the questions we also had was, was Perea's fort in the same location as Rabago's? Did Rabago move the fort? We know he made improvements, but are, are they in the same spot? So trying to figure out the, the evolution of the buildings was a, a key objective of our investigation. And finally, we hope to provide a picture of daily life. A lot of the documentary records that uh, talk about the mission and, and the Presidio, you know, they, they're talking about military matters and religious affairs, and there's not much about the uh, daily life, the days in, you know, day in, day out um, activities of people living on the, on, on the frontier. So we were hoping we could flesh out that picture. And, you know, women and children were here too, and you certainly don't read much about them in the records. So we were hoping that archaeology could re remedy some of that. And um, although TTU did a whole lot of excavations here, um, the work that the TAS did at the site was, was instrumental in helping us address all of these questions. Because as any of you have, that have been on a TAS field school knows, there's nothing like having such a large skilled workforce at hand. And a project like this demands that. So even within a week span of time where we had, and, and I think the first couple of years, we had something like 600 people, it was insane. Um, we were able to open up large scale excavations and examine what was left of the original architecture, which was incredibly productive. So what you're seeing here in this illustration uh, shows you the results of all the excavations. It's color coded by year. You'll note that the red, the blue, and the green are the seasons when the TAS was there. So we were able to um, recover a large sample from the plaza area. And also we were able to investigate a lot of the areas along the, uh, the perimeter of the fort. These are some close up images showing you the, the findings from those excavations. So we were able to extrapolate the uh, layout of these buildings based on what we exposed in our excavations. So from this, we learned that this was, uh, well, what we had were foundations. They were limestone foundations. It's locally quarried limestone. They used a mud mortar. And so what we're getting here is really just the lower course or foundation of the, uh, of the original architecture here. In addition, we were able to identify other features like hard packed floors and cobble pavements and post holes and ash pits. This is the southwest corner. This is the southeast. Again, seeing some of the, the same um, features like our, our limestone building foundations. In addition, there were areas of adobe block and daub and, and large concentrations, which also helped us answer some questions. This is the northeast corner of the fort. The northwest corner, which was where the, the um, 
uh, WPA work was done, we didn't do much over there because they had pretty much removed all the colonial deposits. So there wasn't much that we could get from that area. So we concentrated on these four areas of the fort that again, allowed us to define the outer perimeter of the, the fort's walls. Um, these are some uh, pictures that are from our excavations. This photo on the left shows you, if you can see, they're very faint, but the remains of some adobe blocks that I think is from Perea's original fort. And he had adobe block bastions on all four corners. And I think that's what you're seeing here is part of that because that was located in the Southeast corner. I think that Robigo enclosed the fort with his stone fort later on, but I'm gonna show you a, a, a graphic that kind of shows the evolution of those changes. On the right, what you're looking at is a builder's trench with actual um, logs from the log stockade uh, perimeter. We found this because the THC did some ground penetrating ra uh, radar and electrical resistivity testing that pointed to a feature beneath the surface and we excavated it. And that was amazingly what we found. I don't know if you can see, but you've got a post here, a post here and a post here. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so I wish I could go into more detail about these graphics, but basically if you, if you get a hold of the, the special publication, you can read more about it. But um, what you're seeing here on the right is a graphic that shows the evolution of the fort. Now, Mark Wolf had done an article in the BTAS in a, in a previous volume, and I built upon that work. He had taken some of the preliminary evidence that we had recovered during our early excavations, and then he consulted with some of the maps. There, was, there were two maps that were made in 1767 of the fort, and uh, that was done during a military inspection tour. And also he consulted, and again, um, other accounts to help create four phases of, of building here. And we were able to confirm these phases, which is what you're seeing here on the left side of the screen. But I just wanna point out that, okay, so phase one, that's that's Perea. Phase two, Robigo arrives and builds a, a, a log stockade. Phase three, he begins his, uh, his stone construction with a Casa Fuerte. And then eventually he encloses the whole Presidio in a masonry um, limestone wall. And um, that's where Mark Wolf had ended his phases. But we found during our ex excavations that there were actually two additional rooms that were added along the south wall. I'm calling that phase five. I know that they were built after 1767 because they are not on any of the maps that were, that were created at, during that military inspection tour. So through the huge large-scale excavations that TAS did and then subsequent targeting of areas by the Texas Tech Field School, we were able to create this and confirm this building sequence. So this is a bird's eye view of what the site looks like today. The information that we provided was used to inform the partial reconstruction that was done in 2011 at the site. So what you're seeing now is the, the northwest corner and then the entirety of the fort itself. So the low ruinous walls that you see around are guided by what we found underneath the surface. Um, that's a picture that Jake Ivey had made of the site based on the 1767 maps. You'll also note that there are no rooms along the south wall where we had found them. Finally, um, our last objective was to try to learn something about daily life. And that's where our investigations of middens came in handy. And the TAS opened up excavations in two midden areas within the plaza area of the fort. So you see a plan map of one of them here. Both of the, of the middens produce a lot of faunal material. Here's the other one, as well as colonial materials. The faunal analysis was done by the zooarchaeologist Arlene Fratkin. And that is a section or a chapter in, in, in the special publication, so you can read more about it there. But her conclusions are basically that they were mostly, the Presidio diet was mostly um, relying on uh, uh, domesticated animals. So a lot of beef, uh, sheep, goat, and to a lesser extent, pork. But they were also supplementing their diet with uh, locally available uh, resources. The artifacts gave us a glimpse into domestic life. And so 
these are artifacts that came not just from the middens, but also from the excavations in the rooms, which were the residents of the Presidio soldiers. So you get a glimpse into um, what, um, what household items they had. We didn't find, I mean, maybe less than 2% of the ceramics uh, assemblage from the site are native wares. Everything else is um, from Mexico, uh, primarily. You get some porcelain like this cup up here, Mexican red wares, a lot of Mahalika plates, table wares, and lead glaze vessels, cooking vessels, a um, little bit of, of olive jar. In addition, we found a lot of utensils like these knives here, part of a spoon, parts of, of uh, wine glass bottles, um, handles from cooking utensils. Here you've got a copper handle from a chocolate pot and a lot of sewing equipment, which makes sense. You've got this thimble and some scissors. You know, they're on a, a site that's out in the middle of nowhere. The supply trains aren't always getting there. Sometimes they're not getting there at all. So being able to repair clothes and even um, make clothes would have been a useful skill. Five minutes. The um, this image here, it's, it reflects some of the artifacts that were recovered um, that speak to what people were doing during their downtime, so their leisure time. So we had a lot of uh, mouth harps. So music was obviously something that these folks were engaged in and, and, and was part of um, um, some of the leisure time that uh, whenever they could find it. Um, in addition, what you're seeing here are some game pieces made out of broken pieces of pottery shirts. And this beautiful artifact, which I love, is bone dye, um, that were examples of gaming activities. Um, during the 18th century, back in Spain and in, and in the Spanish colonies, people loved games and table games in particular. And uh, uh, this was not just an activity for men, but women engaged in this too. And all of these artifacts, I think, speak to that. Um, another uh, category of artifact that we found a lot of are items of personal adornment. And you're seeing a lot of that here. So many of these items are likely items that were, um, were belonged to women. So if nothing else, the archaeological record at least says, hey, women were here. And we know that because we see their earrings and their gold paste, or excuse me, their glass paste uh, jewelry items. So this is the, these middle uh, images here are glass paste that would have been part of brooches and, and earrings and bracelets and necklaces. You've got some rings up here. Um, some little drop earrings, which were very popular with the Zarcillo style earrings that women were wearing during that period. These pendant charms are also pretty nice that would have been worn near the heart on a, on a necklace. You've got a pewter bead. This is also part of an earring up here. And a lot of glass trade and coral beads were recovered as well. This little um, glass bauble, it's an earring bauble, is interesting. Um, it was actually something that was mass produced. I know that because I've seen it in other places. And in fact, this is a sketch of an artifact that if you notice is it's almost identical, this bottom section anyways, to a, an artifact that was an earring that was found in Florida. Clothing items were also common. A lot of uh, shoe and clothing buckles that you see here on the left. You've even got some really cool cufflinks. Uh, if you look closely here, you'll see a thistle. Uh, probably part of an officer's uniform or clothing. You've also got parts of, of buttons and then even parts of cloth, surprisingly enough. These textiles here on the bottom were recovered from one of the middens. You've also got some metallic thread and up top here, um, we think this might be part of an epaulet, so perhaps part of an officer's uniform. Um, oops. Okay, so Obviously, they were also a religious people, and that's, that shows up in, in the artifacts that we've recovered. Uh, for example, you find in the collection several mass-produced crucifixes like this, so they're almost identical when you look closely at them. There's also a lot of jet rosary beads. This is a, a little um, religious medallion that depicts Virgin Mary with child. And this little item here, at first I thought it was just um, something that was uh, unique to the site, but actually it's a little cross. I think that these little 
rounded areas represent the Holy Trinity. Uh, and it would have been strong and worn on a necklace likely, or maybe even a bracelet. But I have seen these now in South Texas at the San Antonio missions and also in Mexico. So they were also mass produced. Um, not surprisingly, there's a lot of military related equipment like guns and, and uh, uh, gun flints and lead shot. We've got a bullet worm. This is a good example here of, of what these artifacts look like after they're clean. So this is part of a flintlock mechanism. Um, you've got part of a top jaw and screw here, finials and um, uh, gun sights. So a lot of this kind of stuff, which is expected, also showing up in those middens. Um, horse gear is also something that we found a lot of at the site, including parts of bridles, horseshoe nails, and then you've got a lot of these saddle trappings here. Um, you've got coscojos and jinglers that were hanging off both bridles and probably uh, saddles um, and saddle blankets. And of course, we've got this lovely higa, which served as a coast coho, but also the sign of the fist was, uh, of the clenched fist was a, um, a symbol that was believed to ward off the evil eye. So having it on your horse, maybe bring you a little extra layer of protection. Okay, Woo! I went through that really fast. <laughs> so, um, uh, and I, I wish I could I could do do more, but in 15 minutes it's hard to talk about all of it. But maybe that'll encourage you to actually buy the book. Um, so if you know, although the last this is this report really represents the last of the investigations here, it's not the the, the last chapter of the story. Uh, the fact that we that the TAS has been working with me at San Lorenzo means that there's another chapter to this story. That is a site that is closely related to San Saba. And if I've learned nothing else from this process, I have learned the value of having the TAS as an enormous resource for projects like this. I look forward to a, a continuing elaborate, co collaboration with the TAS and um, hopefully another TAS special publication when I complete uh, the analysis of the work that we've done at Mission San Lorenzo. So. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Um, I, I will say that um, my my first TAS field school was actually was Camp Wood, and I could not have asked for a better um, a better introduction into working um, with you and with TAS. You're right. I mean, it's, it's, oh, wow. it's an incredible opportunity, and the yeah. amount of work they get done in six days is incredible. <laughs> oh yeah, you should see it in the lab. It's insane, but you learn to appreciate it because it really is so valuable, such oh, a valuable goodness, yes. resource. Yeah. Yes. Um, so now we have some time for questions. Um, if there are questions that are coming in from the chat, um, uh, Liz or Becky, if you want to see what we've got. I'm watching so far, you know, there's a delay in the video. So right. if anybody's got questions, if you'll type them in there, we'll get them to Tamara. So far, we don't have anything, but I'll chime in when we do. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I get well, Tamara. <laughs> Tamara, I have a question for you. So how many field schools uh, have, well, how many different missions or presidios have you conducted field schools at here in Texas? Because I know it's more than the two that you just mentioned. Um, one, oh gosh, okay. So uh, two missions, is it two missions? Three missions, three missions um, and a presidio. So yeah. <laughs> and almost all yeah all of them that TAS was a part of except for except for this last summer at uh, Mission San Jose so that was just Texas Tech well as Sarah mentioned it's it's a it's a really rare opportunity to be able to work at a site like this and so my yeah. first TAS field school was at San Saba and then of course I was at Camp Wood and I, I mean, it's it's mind blowing. <laughs> oh yeah, what, it is. What is still left? What is still left behind? Yeah. Well, part of it is is that these are rural sites and they're not in an urban setting. So, you know, there's a lot to be said. I mean, I learned a lot working at Mission San Jose this summer when you're working in a city like San Antonio and you realize, holy crap, <laughs> yeah. it is. It's just a. It's just a different ball game altogether. A lot more challenging in an urban setting. Yeah, no kidding. Not to mention that 
you have you know your stratigraphy like triples. <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about micro stratigraphy, and then you yeah. gotta you know, and what you're actually looking for is any intact deposits. Yeah. So <laughs> that's not the case at these sites. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I mean I like you know, again, I was gonna say as a as, you know as a as a fellow historical archaeologist, it's always fun to you know to um to work on sites where I'm like, oh, I know this period. This totally makes sense to me. You know? <laughs> So, yeah. um, it's nice. It's nice. You know, it's, uh, my, my background, I came from, you know, English colonial archeology span when I, um, on the East coast. So it was like, it's just, it's just, um, similar enough that there's a college, um, right. with, with, of course, you know, the, the slight exception of the fact that, you know, the English were so anti-Catholic <laughs> that, it, you know, that everything shows up, but it's a yeah. lot, it's a lot of fun to, to, to be able to explore that. And particularly how they try to figure out what, you know, what it meant to have, a Catholic mission or, or a presidio on, you know, uh, in the middle of Texas. <laughs> when, right, when, right, when right. You've got, you've got the French, you've got the Spanish, you've got, you know, um, you've got native populations that have been there for thousands of years that are trying to figure out what the hell these guys are doing. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, it makes for such a really interesting melting pot of archaeology. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It really does. Okay, I'm going to jump in. It's Liz Coonwin. So we've got a uh, comment from the feed, and that is from Bennett Kemble saying, great presentation. <laughs> well, I should say, thank you, Bennett, because um, I didn't have time to talk about it. But, um, you know, this didn't just generate, this work here didn't just generate uh, a special report. Bennett had, had uh, written his thesis on the Southeast Bastion where he was actually able to, to confirm its exact configuration because there were some confusions based on previous maps that were made during the 18th century. And that was a part of a, a, an article that was done in the TA, that was put in the TAS. So um, it's not just this work, but I had four theses that came out of this and um, a number of publications in the, in the bulletin. So, um, and Bennett was a big part of that. So thanks for the props, Bennett. <laughs> um, I will say, uh, because I forgot to say this in the introduction, that both Special Publication 6, which um, Dr. Walter just discussed, and Special Publication Session uh, 7, which we'll talk to about in a minute, are available for purchase um, on the TAS website um, in the store section. Um, the Special Publication 6, I think, is going for um, $30, which includes shipping, um, and Special Publication 7 is 15 so you can find those on our website. Um, we'll get them out to you. Uh, I have seen I have seen the PDF versions of them. They're fantastic. I will have them in hard copy, um, which is something for me because I don't usually get hard copy versions. I have so many things in my library already, uh, but they're beautiful volumes and they're worth owning. Thanks. And we've got a couple a couple more entries here. Um, there's a comment from James Everett saying, "I really enjoy your presentations Aww. on San Saba. Every time I see one, thank you." Oh. And I'll then, pay you later, James. <laughs> and then Nick Morgan was asking if uh, you had mentioned anything about the horse skull that was excavated by Bob Burleson, and has it been determined when the school skull might have been interred and by whom? Okay, so it it's not a horse skull; it's it's a cow skull. Sorry to say. <laughs> So that was what was uh, determined by our uh, faunal analyst. So I'm sorry to say, uh, I think it was early, must have been very early within the history of the Presidio because of its location. So that's my guess. Because it was pretty deep. Were there, were there other animal burials or was that the one? I mean, I, I, yeah. Well, it was just the skull. So mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. It was weird. Yeah. I don't know why it was like that. Um, but no, but we had a lot of articulated faunal remains, which suggests to us that they were burying everything pretty quickly. So I don't know, maybe they threw it in a hole. And yeah, that's, that's interesting. Oh, like, you know, you know, or maybe just, yeah, maybe it's just to get rid of the smell. Who knows? Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think that happened because I don't think because the Comanche were constantly circ circling the Presidio. So I don't think they dared go out and dig a hole. I mean, I always thought that, you know, they limited their activities outside the walls of the fort, but who knows? Makes sense to me. Um, any other co comments coming in through YouTube, Liz? Uh, nothing so far. And I think we're almost to the 1120 changeover time. Okay. If I, if I have, although I, I def right. I'll defer to the t official timekeeper. <laughs> it's official. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, in that case, uh, thank you, Dr. Walter, very much thank for that you. presentation. Um, next up, we have Kristen Embry, uh, professional archaeologist with the United States Department of the Interior and Fish and Wildlife Service. Ms. Embry has 15 years of supervisory archaeological experience on both historic and prehistoric sites under her belt across a wide swath of the United States, including projects in Arizona, California, Colorado, Kentucky, New Mexico, Oregon, Texas, and Utah. Uh, special publication number seven focuses on the archaeological investigation of the TAS youth group at the Williams Buck Homestead during the 2001 and 2002 field schools. Ms. Embry, the field is yours. And by field, I mean floor. <laughs> Howdy there. Okay, let me share my presentation. Bear with me. Okay, so yes, I've spent the last few months um, on wildland fires, and when I got word about this presentation, I was really excited to, to share more about this site and the work that was done through TAS um, in 2001 and 2002. So it's been a while coming, um, but I was really happy to contribute to uh, making sure that this information was presented and, and published and, and also to the, the pool of historic archaeological investigations that have been done a lot by Tamara. Um, uh, I wanted to first say, for those of you who don't know, uh, this is Mike Collins uh, homestead. I, don't, I believe he's living there um, at present with his wife, uh, their ranch. Uh, Williams Buck has been in the process of being restored and managed and protected by the Collins clan since I think 1966. Um, and recently they put a conservation easement on the property, um, which is now held by the Nature Conservancy of Texas. Uh, so they're continuing that work to preserve this site. Um, and it, you know, it's got some fantastic history. Because this is a historical project, there is a lot of historical research. Um, you know, context is important. Um, and I think in, in the monograph, it's something like 15 pages long, uh, the background history for the, the project. So I don't have enough time to go over all of that today. Um, so I'm gonna give you sort of the, the Cliff Notes version of the history. But sort of in general, in 2001 and 2002, the TAS youth group conducted excavations at the Williams Buck site. Investigations focused on an area 20 meters southwest of the principal feature of the site, which is the dog trot structure you're seeing there. Um, the family standing in front of the dog trot are the Bucks, uh, the second folks to live in that, um, on that homestead and in that structure. The primary goal of the work was to determine whether or not the excavation area was the location of a lean-to structure built by Williams, um, William W. Williams, in 1848 or 1849. So it's sort of let's get to the history. Oh, well, so here's the area. Uh, we're in Williamson County and here's a second picture of the homestead. And I think this picture on the right is when Walter um, and Margaret Collins completed restoration of the homestead in 66 or 67. So William W. Williams was born in Tennessee in 1806. Several local histories indicate Williams came to Texas as early as 1848, putting up a lean-to and making improvements prior to acquiring title to the land. Constructing a shelter would have been a prime concern for newcomers. The use of temporary shelters such as tents was not uncommon in the area. The Brysons, for example, who claim land six kilometers southwest of Williams Buck, lived in their wagons for some time prior to building a log barn with native cedar. By 1846 and until 1854, making improvements would have served to, served to lay claim to public lands under the Republic and later the state uh, pre, a preemption pre grant. So, while the 1850 census lists Williams and family in Scott County, Arkansas, As a farmer owning no land, service records indicates that Williams was in Brushy Creek, Williamson County in October, 1846. Um, he was there to enlist um, under Shipley P. Ross um, 
as the Texas Mounted Volunteers, um, that group did take part in the Mexican American War. So it's really likely that Williams was there. He continued to be there participating in the war until 1848 and, or 1849, when he probably came back to this land he was eyeballing and um, started to make some improvements on the land. Um, by 1849 or Yes, 1849, John F. Weber of uh, Weberville fame, um, I've worked on some other archaeological projects related to Weber, um, had held um, or had a patent on the land, uh, uh, but apparently he never settled in it, uh, and he's listed in the Travis County census um, in 1850. So it's possible that Williams came back and was working on this land, and potentially um, for up to several years, um, it was not until 1851 uh, when he purchased the land from Weber. In 1850, three fourths of the male adults in Williamson County are listed as farmers or other professions which combine their work with farming. Family farms and subsistence agriculture was the norm until the Civil War when economic downturn, depletion and overgrazing of the region's thin topsoil forced many to turn to stock raising. Uh, such was the case with the Williams neighbors, uh, kind of a famous group of uh, brothers named the, named the uh, uh, Snyder brothers, um, who started foundations um, of cattle um, outfits that went off to establish um, the large outfits in Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Montana. Residents during this time also turned to harvesting ash juniper, known locally as cedar. In 1849, Williams dies and his son and son-in-law sell large parcels of the land, uh, first to a G. Bryant and then to an R. E. Brooks. Strangely enough, my work in the area has also come across and worked with the uh, Brooks family who were related to the Burlesons. Um, he was a well-known judge. And in 1901, the year he purchases the Williams Buck homestead, he enters the oil business, forming the Texas Fuel Company, later known as Texaco. In 1901, Brooks sells the homestead to Abner Buck, born in Montgomery, um, Arkansas, which is timber country. Um, from what little I can gain on the Buck family, um, most of it comes from recorded interviews of Walter Collins, um, recorded in 1991 by anthropologist uh, Martha Berryman of UTSA's Institute of Texan Cultures. Berryman recorded various stories William and Buck descendants had shared with Walter Collins, some of who had lived on or nearby the homestead as part of a preliminary report for the construction of a full-scale replica of the dog trot for the 1992 Texas Folklife Festival, which is there in the right. Berryman's interviews recorded the Bucks as, quote, self-sufficient and liked enough, but considered different, what some referred to as hillbilly. The family grew cotton as a cash crop, raised razorback hogs, smoked meat, and solely relied on trade and barter. They uh, never acquired modern devices or electricity and rode to town on horse and buggy into the 1940s, which provided a curiosity for the town folk. By the turn of the century, uh, most of the wealthier farmers in Western Williamson County had moved, moved several, according to the ten census, uh, where he's listed as a farmer, cannot read or write. Uh, he's living with seven uh, children, adult children, ages 20 to 35. So these buck boys uh, probably supplemented the farm, farm economy, harvesting cedar in the area. Um, by the 1880s, uh, charcoal burners were really popular in the area, uh, in and around the hill country. And uh, later on at the turn of the century, the economy for cedar was more geared towards building shingles, um, barns, rail ties, fence posts, uh, telephone poles, um, as opposed to charcoal. So let's talk a little bit about the summary of the field school uh, for each year, because we have 2001 and 2002. The primary goal, goal of the, the excavations, as I've discussed before, was to figure out if the area selected for excavation, which is southwest of the dog trot, as you can see there, um, if it was this lo uh, location for a lean to dating as early as 1848. 
In 2001 and 2002, 21 uh, units were excavated. I'm gonna actually go back to that last slide. Um, and uh, it, according to the field school manual, the area was selected, um, it, well, for several reasons. It, the area stood out, the soils were different. Um, there was a piling of rocks there. Um, and also, according to the manual, a uh, quote, a local farmer, the nephew of William's widow, so he had two wives, um, her name was Jane, Jane Williams, uh, was brought to the farm in the 1960s so she could see it one last time. Um, in quotes, they say, the much younger wife. She pointed to the area you will be excavating and said it was the spot her husband had built his lean to and where he lived for two years while he cleared land and built the cabin. So we have an oral history that says this is the location. Initial reporting, although from 2001, um, Joan Few was the director, suggested the central um, portion of the low mounded area, half a circular ash stain and a possible post hole uh, called, I think, feature one or feature, no, feature one, feature two is the post hole, um, may be associated with the lean two. Excavations in 2002 found that the limestone rocks, uh, which few had identified again here as possibly being related to the lean to structure, were random in size, intermixed with late 19th century and early 20th century artifacts. Uh, this suggests that the rocks, along with the artifacts, were dumped at this spot. In addition, no mortar or daub was found adhering to the limestone. And the possible post hole was determined to be a burn tree stump down here. That's feature two. There was no concentrations of architectural materials to suggest an occupational period within the testing area and none of the deposits within the testing area as initially surmised in 2001, definitively dated to the 1840s or the 1850s. So what could this lack of evidence um, for the lean-to mean if the oral history indicated the lean-to was here. This is sort of an overlay of Fuse map and my map of the 2002 excavations. Um, so as you can see, it sort of doesn't line up. Uh, we have this clustering in the center. And unfortunately, few had not um, had uh, the crews record these rocks, clusters of rocks on the unit levels. So we only have this overview map, which you know, it looks like kind of an estimation of the location. So while I figured it was possible that the limited nature of excavations, you know, we dug down 30 centimeters in some areas, we did have some a few deeper units, um, but the limited nature of the excavations could be the blame, right? Um, but I kind of could, didn't sit well, right? The whole story about uh, William's younger wife having come out to the land in the 60s. Uh, so I did some more digging. Um, so William's wife, second wife, Jane, is listed as 45 years of age in the 1880 census and 65 years of age in the 1900 census. While a death, death certificate could not be located for Jane's, it seemed improbable um, that the ages in both the ins, the Censuses were inaccurate and unreasonable to believe that Jane lived to visit the homestead in the 60s at the approximate age of 125 years old. So I reached out to Joan Few in 2019 and she couldn't recall what information, um, you know, that the field, the field school manual had cited this oral history and, and couldn't uh, really remember much. I mean, it's 2001 and 2002. Um, and there was no mention of uh, any oral history besides that one reference in the field school manuals or the field school paperwork. Uh, there was also no mention of that excellent oral history project that I've, I've mentioned before, conducted in 1991 uh, by the Institute of Texas Cultures. So I reached out to them and tracked that document down. And um, it turns out that there are several accounts in this large document that account for this location of a lean-to. Um, and all of them indicate it was near spring and not southwest of the dog trap, but southeast. Uh, in Berryman's report in 1991, um, there are several mentions of a lean-to or a one-room cabin. Um, and one 
particular mention is uh, this fellow right here in the middle, uh, Jim, I think it's Bill, excuse me, Bill Williams is sitting in the middle on that left picture. And he in indicates that he lived in that one room structure next to the spring. Um, and Walter Collins uh, later in the interview states, there's a nice spring Southeast of the dog trot. Suspect that spring is what first drew Williams to the place. That is where he built his first lane too. So it seems like it was, it, it, descendants had given conflicting information about the lean two, and that's what T.A. Scott was sort of a conflicting and maybe partial uh, story. Um, also, it's likely, very likely that they didn't have um, any information on that south that southeastern location because um, there's no evidence to indicate that that was investigated. So the secondary goal of excavations was to obtain a sample, a sample of the artifacts from the testing area. I think 5,400 artifacts were recovered in total. Um, so let's go into some detail about what those artifacts suggest. Evidence suggests that the excavation area served as a trash deposit for the inhabitants of the nearby dog trot. The majority of materials recovered date from the 1870s to the 1920s, with a small quantity of mid 19th century artifacts, including transfer printed ceramics that more likely represent curated materials that eventually ended up in the trash deposit. One distinct concentration of dump materials and two shallow trash field features were recorded cross mending the reconstruction of vessels from fragments found in different proveniences establishes that fragments of at least 10 vessels were found separated wi widely, both horizontally and vertically. Significantly, fragments found in the mountain midden cross men with fragments found in features one and features two. So the mountain midden is sort of this area here and features one and features two. So you can see we have all of these um, artifacts, the black art, true cross mending, um, either ceramic sherds or glass vessels. And the gray are um, features given in, or artifacts given an MNI of one because they shared so many um, similarities, uh, uh, um, unique colors, uh, shapes or forms. Um, and again, a lot of these artifacts were, uh, you know, super tumbled over. So a lot of them didn't cross men, but we had 10. Um, and it shows you sort of the mixed up nature of this deposit. The mounted feature and shallow pits are likely the result of activities where trash from a primary dump, maybe nearer to the, the dog trot, was scraped, maybe swept and transported, dumped in the central area and used to fill low spots in the landscape, such as the burned tree stump feature two, possibly also feature one, a low um, depression. There is uh, little evidence for in situ firing, um, even though some of the artifacts are burned and we do have uh, burned wood. Um, densities of ash and charcoal are scattered throughout that whole excavation block, suggesting um, that the fill may have been dumped rather than burned in place. Five minutes. Okay. While the majority of artifacts in the dump fill date from the 1870s to the 1920s, there were several fragments of light green bottle with a basal perimeter stippling um, recovered in features one and also in the central midden in levels at the top levels and at the bottom. Basal stippling first appeared in the 1940s um, on Duraglass bottles produced by Owens, Illinois. Um, this significantly, these uh, fragments are heat altered. Um, so it may suggest um, even though it's an outlier and really one of the only post 1940s artifacts, but it may suggest that there was burning um, and infill sometime post 1940. And that kind of would make sense because in 1940s is when senior buck dies and um, there must have been a lot of change and, a, uh, and possibly a, a cleanup of the area. So artifacts recovered during the excavations represent items acquired and disposed of on a rural farm during the last decades of the Williams occupation and the first decades of the Buck family time in the nearby dog trot. They provide a glimpse into the daily lives of the two families. Oops, I've jumped a little too far. Artifacts recovered are dominated by small fragments of indefinite containers. <clears throat> Excuse me, eating my own hair. Made of metal and glass. Uh, Second most common items are personal metal and glass items containing tobacco or alcohol. 
you know, we did find a fair share of ceramics, but significantly smaller. Um, and most of them are refined earthen wares and table wares, although we do have uh, stoneware in the collection. Excuse me, I keep jumping ahead. Uh, 71 of the ceramics recovered percent of the ceramics recovered are expensive decorated white uh, earthenwares and porcelains, some with maker's marks indicating manufacture in England. Uh, there are five colors of transfer printed shirts uh, with a, a mean production uh, beginning date of 1817 and an ending date of 1889. This suggests that the folks living in this home, and again, this is a mixed deposit, so we can't be certain if this transfer wear belongs with the Williams family or the Bucks, but this suggests that they had the means to own expensive ceramic vessels. We know um, that Williams' real and personal holdings are listed as $2,000 and $1,000 respectively in the 1870 census. And his neighbor, or his closest neighbor, is a merchant, um, actually, who is the namesake of the nearby closest town. And his personal uh, holdings are 2000. Um, so it may have been that Williams had the ability to purchase these uh, fine earthenwares. 86% of the refined earthenwares recovered are, are undecorated and may likely be from undecorated portions of decorated vessels. Um, and given the difficulty, in um, I, re reliably documenting and uh, identifying what white bodied earthenwares such as porcelain or pearlware, whiteware and ironstone, I decided to sort them using a steel uh, scratch test. Um, also based on decoration and glaze color, um, the hardness value and porosity, um, the expectation is you know, the softest, uh, least dense, um, with porous non-vitreous paste will be the creamware and the pearlware. Uh, whitewares are semi-vitreous, um, have a harder paste than the creamwares and pearlwares, and ironstones will have the most dense paste and be most vitrified. Um, in total, 50% of the sherds recovered um, have a vitreous paste. And that makes sense um, because by the mid 1850s, ironstone became the dominant uh, type in use. Uh, for decorated wares, for molded transfer print, and um, utilized until the end of the uh, 19th century. An estimated 5% of the vessels are hand painted, uh, white and pearlware pearl tea wear vessels. The cheapest and most popular color decorated tea wares from, dating from the 1790s through the 19th century. Uh, the majority of them have this chrome oxide drive colors like that bright green, uh, the bright reds and yellows, especially the pinks. And uh, those are pretty diagnostic to a post-1830 date. Uh, there are comparatively few porcelain vessels in the collection, uh, but one soft paste porcelain, which this is, it has a significant loss of semi-gloss glaze on high points in the molded design. Um, also, there's a now fugitive uh, gold overglaze gilding that's also um, really worn down. Uh, this wear pattern you know, suggests a scrubbing with an abrasive such as sand. Um, and this is a pattern we also see on uh, the molded ironstone, the white granite there. Um, on a lot of the specimens, a few of the transfer as well. So this suggests that these items were heavily used. Um, and even though they're ex expensive ceramics, uh, they were, I mean, maybe they were scrubbing everything with sand, but certainly heavily used. Artifacts that post date the 1901, um, or post date 1901, we know are tied to the Buck family. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this more um, in self uh, artifacts that relate to the oral history that suggest the Bucks are self-sufficient and relied on horse and draft animals um, aren't diagnostic. Uh, so we can't say for certain that they relate to the Bucks. Uh, some of the clothing items we do, uh, we have a lot of um, handmade um, items. We have a possible blacksmith drill, um, some expedient tools that are um, smithed as well, and also a lot of horseshoe nails. Uh, we know that Buck raised um, saddle mules. It was something that he was, he was well known for. Photographs um, of the Bucks in front of their porch and of their porch give us some really valuable clues into the kinds of activities they engaged in. Um, in one picture to the right, you can see there are multiple, both pictures. They have multiple shelves, tables lined with storage wares. 
um, the quantity of glass and jars uh, from the collection is, is really a lot. That's one of the biggest things we have. And it probably or certainly reflects food processing and storage activities, um, the preserving of home grown produce um, it combined with hunting and fishing likely were important sources of food for the family. Um, but the predominance of what we see are these early machine made jars, these later transitional um, pieces that date from well 19, 1900 to 1910. Um, uh, we see a diversity in glass closures um, and increase in, you know, it indicates there's an increase in glass use, manufacturing, automation, refinement, ex expanded availability, but also these bucks who were super self-sufficient and didn't use cash were clearly buying things, buying new things, uh, certainly a lot of glass. So again, this photo suggests that, um, su suggests more, uh, especially the fact that the Bucks kept a swept and maintained yard. Uh, Walter Collins notes in his interview with Berryman that, quote, on the outside of the fence was an accumulation of 120, 120 years of discarded items. The fence lies 10 meters northeast of the excavation block. Storage wares and other production related items were often used outside of the kitchen, stored on porches, in yard spaces, and in outbuildings. These spheres of use may have resulted in higher quantities of these types of artifacts in the nearby trash midden. Uh, the lower quantities of more curated items, such de as the decorative housewares, may indicate that the deposit may not have served as a general dumping spot, more of a specialty dumping spot. Other aspects of the post-1901 Buck family assemblage uh, suggest the family relied on store -bought pro other store-bought products uh, like commercially prepared uh, uh, food goods. Um, we have a whole bunch of sanitary cans um, and they will spread throughout the ex excavation block. We've got a lot of um, these beverage containers, uh, this one on the right, the armoire's grape is a, a sort of a, a health tonic grape juice. Um, but the, the appearance of it, the high quantities of containers, sanitary cans, flavoring extra, extracts, um, all represent this dramatic shift to more, from more traditional food ways to a new reliance on consumerism. Kristen? You've yes. got about 30 seconds. If okay, we have okay. Any, even a few minutes for, for QA. Okay, awesome. Well, I will try and get through this real quick. Uh, the same, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, the same early transitional from mouth blown to machine made glass throughout the collection, um, including these uh, tobacco um, snuff containers. Um, and uh, some of these have um, press and I think it's press and blow. I'm not going to forget, but the early transitional, some of the first machine made um, glass type containers. We have uh, still quite a lot of mouth blown um, bottles and uh, mouth blown uh, crown top uh, beer bottles are really uncommon. Um, and we've got a few of those in the collection as well. So, you know, this sort of may indicate brand loyalty. There's a lot of the same, uh, including these brandy wine um, vessels. Um, or it also might say that there wasn't a lot of choice in the, re re um, in the area uh, from what they could purchase. The regular recovery of alcohol bottles, some may be ma manufactured as early as 1885, date from the mouth blown to the machine made transition area era. Uh, by 1917, no more than 10% of the bottles and jars in the U.S. were mouth-blown mouth or hand-blown. So we have a lot of these brandy bottles. I don't think I'm going to have enough time to go into detail about them, um, but a lot of them are a common type, uh, back here, the whiskey bottles, um, common from the 1890s to the first 10 years, uh, 10 years prior to the prohibition. Um, we have some of these A and B are mouth blown with hand tooled finishes. And then we have a lot of these early, what we assume are early machine bottles based on some of these other um, bases we have. Some of these, we have several of these um, bases marked with a B with two serifs. And uh, they seem to be associated with Charles Bolt who um, manufactured whiskey bottles from 1900 to 1919. 
Um, one has an Owen scar, and we know that in 1909, Bolt acquired exclusive rights to manufacture liquor, uh, liquor bottles on the Owens um, machine. So it seems likely that these bases um, it's, and a lot of these bottles represent liquor botter, bo bottles um, made on this um, during this time period and this early um, machine manufacture. Some bottles may re represent mail order liquor bottles popular from 1900 to 1910 in dry areas of the nation. Uh, we have some uh, here, some uh, volume notations, um, which are, are found rarely on bottles that predate 1913 when the gold amendment was put into place. Um, volume notation is common on early machine made mail ordered liquor, liquor bottles up to until 1913. Um, when the Webb Ke uh, Kenyan Act prohibited shipping of liquor to uh, dry states. Um, can I have maybe two more minutes? Just kind of eat into my, um, to my uh, Q&A time. We, well, we are right we, about at time, but. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Is that okay? So wanna, yeah, yeah, I only have a, That's okay. Just we'll wrap it up. Yeah. And then, yeah, um, sure thing. Mm -hmm. Sure thing. So we have several. Um, proprietary medicine uh, medicine bottles that we know were also really popular substitute cheap alcohol, including um, on the left was a Jamaica ginger bottle and on the right, a bitters bottle. Um, the bitters bottle is probably a little bit older. Uh, the Jamaica ginger had uh, something like 75 to 90% alcohol content. Uh, mail ordered liquor and the use of alcohol substitutes may have been the only socially acceptable way to obtain alcohol at the time. Uh, Western Williamson County was a dry area. And in particular for the Bucks, the consumption of alcohol may have been really difficult considering that they were members of Loafer's Glory Church, which ironically is a name that um, was given to them uh, for the way the church congregation acted, uh, Loafer's Glory. Um, and the, it was really close to the homestead. In fact, very close to the homestead on the corner of the Collins current acreage. Um, and they were known for quote, um, helping people find salvation and also being cured of various afflictions. We know that the Buck sisters, um, took over the property in 1913 after, and after their father died, they relied on neighbors for trade. And so we have a lot of oral history about one of the sisters, Riddy, who according to Mike Collins, eventually went blind from her addictions, uh, dying in 1956 due to complications from a fall into the dog trot fireplace. Uh, so many suffered from paralysis. Um, J Jamaica Ginger was had a name called Jake Leg, which was a kind of paralysis people would get from consuming it. Um, blindness through the consumption of bootleg alcohol and substitutes was really and, and by 1900, alcohol was having a serious impact on communities, and many problems associated with industrialization were attributed to alcohol abuse. Uh, the main stated goal of this project was to determine whether or not the excavation area was the location of the lean-to. Uh, while the TAS was unable to locate the lean-to, what was uncovered uh, was, is possibly more uh, illuminating. The contrast between two families occupying the same space, but on either side of a pivotal and transitional time in the story of the American West. The completion of the Austin and Northwestern Railroad brought a dynamic change to the everyday lives of people. The railroad, along with increased mechanization and manufacture, allowed families of modest means to afford goods considered a luxury a generation before. Sod lumber, heavy machinery, home appliances, packaged foodstuffs, the impact of these events in history is illustrated in the archaeological record left by the Williams, representing the first wave of Anglo-American settlers, bringing what little they could carry on horseback, on wagon, on schooner. And the Buck family, who, according to the eldest son, Crutchfield, put furniture, farm equipment, animal, and family into a boxcar in Arkansas, arriving no more than 20 miles from the homestead, fully provisioned able to furnish the remaining needs with the aids of Sears, Roback and Co. It's thought, it's through these everyday items that we are able to gain a better understanding of what day-to-day -day life was like for the people in Williamson County in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, and that's it. Thank awesome. you for bearing with me and <laughs> no, listening to me read that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a, you know, it's a big monograph. I 
hope um, that people purchase it, uh, find my illustrations and my discussions to be helpful, uh, especially with regard to transitional um, late 19th century, early 20th century artifacts yeah. um, in Central Texas. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for talking. Um, thanks yes. to you and thanks to Tamara um, and yeah. thanks to everyone joining us. Um, we are, um, we're going to cut now because this is actually the same account that's hosting the, the business lunch in five minutes. Um, oh. So it's all good. It's, no, it's, this is great. Um, I'll just wind up by saying thank you both for talking. And again, if you are interested in purchasing these volumes, you can do that on the TAS website. Um, I look forward to